Okay, so good morning. Welcome to the second day of our workshop. And I, uh, I'd just like to say that, to remind you, since it's not on the program, I'd like to make sure that everyone knows that we're having the conference dinner tonight. And we're going to meet at, uh, I, I, I suggest we're going to leave at 8 o'clock. Uh, and so we'll meet in the piazza just outside of the scuola and just try and be there a little earlier so we can all leave at 8 o'clock. Okay, I'll just say this later on because it's nearly half of us here now. So, which is a pity because now we're having a very, very interesting tutorial by Simone on ambiguity, convexing, uh, convexity and hedging. So please, Simone. Okay, okay. so... Uh, also last year, if I remember correctly, I talked about convexity, but I talked about convexity under risk, okay? Uh, and this year's tutorial is going to be different uh, uh, under many respects, even if I, you know, if I get the time to talk about choice under risk. Since it's a tutorial, we'll start with the very introductory slide, meaning just I will talk about problems of choice under risk, problem of choice under ambiguity. So what is a problem of choice under uncertainty? Well, problem of choice under uncertainty, we think of a decision maker with preferences over different alternatives, okay? These alternatives yield different outcomes. Why different outcomes? Because these outcomes are not known at the moment of choice, okay? And these outcomes are aleatory. They depend on a random realization. The distance, the, we have two, so this is why uncertainty is present. Now, the difference between risk and ambiguity, problem of choice under risk, problem of choice under ambiguity, exactly depends on the type of uncertainty involved. If the uncertainty is of the kind where odds are known, like think of games of chance, like you know, playing a roulette wheel, throwing a dice, and so on and so forth, then we, we will be talking about risk. On the other hand, if odds are not known, so most of the economic problems are exactly of the type of choice under ambiguity, meaning that you do not know what are the odds, what is the probability that an, a stock is gonna go up 4% or a currency is gonna drop by 5%, then we will be talking about night and uncertainty or ambiguity, okay? Today talk I will mostly confine myself to choice under ambiguity, okay? But just for the sake of simplicity, you know, well, for sake of clarity, let me just give you two situations, two different problems of choice, where the first one is problem of choice under risk, and the second one is problem, a problem of choice under ambiguity. So as first bullet point saying, we will probably not cover this part, choice under risk, but just to be everybody on the same page, for example, consider four lotteries. Those are four alternatives, okay? Notice that you choose, you might choose A versus B or B versus A. When you choose A or B, you do not know, or at least for B, you do not know what is going to be the outcome you're gonna receive. This outcome will depend on known probabilities. 0.1%, for example, you will receive, well, here it's still in dollars. So zero dollars or euros, 0.89 you will receive one million, 0.10 you will receive five million. So it's a problem of choice under uncertainty, under uncertainty but you know the odds, okay? The odds are, are known to you, they are told to you. On the contrary, choice under night and uncertainty slash ambiguity, well, again, outcomes depend on an uncertain event, but here the odds are not known. So one typical situation that is used over and over again is, our, is a problem of choice where the state space is specified by an Asperger. So what is it? Well, here, again, you have an urn, so with 90 balls. They can be, these balls can either be red, black, or green. Uh, you know that there are 90 balls. You know that 30 of these balls are red but you do not know the proportion of blue and yellow. You just know that 60 are either blue or yellow, but you do not know the relative proportions, okay? So here, alternatives, well, for example, in this example, I gave you four alternatives, four bets. For example, the first one pays you one euro if 
red is the color of the ball drawn, zero otherwise. Uh, A2 gives you one euro if the ball drawn is blue, zero otherwise. Well, here, for example, for A2, you do not know the odds of one. Okay, you do not know the odds with which you will be paid. Why? Because again, you know that there are 60 balls that are either blue or green, but you do not know how many blue balls are in the urn. Okay, so the odds are not known to you. Yes. Yes, because in my mind, uh, probably G is giallo, so yellow in Italian, and so that's why, yes, yes. I, yes, I apologize. So, of course, yes, yellow is isomorphic to G because it's giallo in Italian. No, I, okay, I'll try to stick, but it will, uh, this example will enter in the picture just uh, one more time, and one more time, this is, when I said yellow, I meant G, which is green. So I will stick to green from now on. But, uh, so, do you want me to go over this slide again, or I bored you enough uh, with, okay. So, what, is this, what has been the standard model for many years, and arguably it is even nowadays the model for many applications, you know, model, to model the decision maker preferences for a problem of choice under uncertainty, it's, sorry, it's the expected utility model, okay? So in the example I discussed before, there were three states of the world, red, blue, and green, okay? And so, here, the decision, maker, uh, the decision maker preferences are modeled through the expected utility functional, which means that the decision maker acts as if he has a probability over this state space. Even though, even though there is not an objective probability, there is the, comp the earned composition is not known to the decision maker, the decision maker, ah, I keep on pressing, the decision maker acts as if he has a probability in mind. Okay. Another ingredient of expected utility is a utility U over outcomes, real, reals, okay? Because we were talking about monetary prices. And the decision maker has preferences over bets, acts, that is function that to each state of the world, to each ball extracted from the urn, attaches a real number, a monetary outcome, okay? So expected utility basically says that the decision maker, is, his preferences are represented by this function. That is, in evaluating a bet F, he acts as if he has a probability P over the states of the world, and in evaluating F, he computes the expected utility of the bet F, okay? Now, having made this quick introduction, I can tell you what is, the, what is the goal of this talk. The goal of this talk is to say, well, I will argue that first I will consider preferences that exhibit an inclination for edging mixing. That is a preference for diversification. And I will argue that even though these preferences might not be expected utility, and in a moment I will argue also why, reasonably so, why they may not be expected utility, still I can identify a part of the decision maker preferences where edging has no bite. And this part of the decision maker preferences are exactly the part of the decision maker where he behaves exactly like an expected utility agent. Okay, so that I can reread is preferences, I can reinterpret his preferences as coming through a decision process where he's trying to extend his expected utility rankings to the entire set of bets. If this introduction is not, and probably and hopefully at the same time, is not clear to you, the only message I want you to take from this slide is the following. Give me any preferences for problem of choice under uncertainty, I can isolate the part where the decision maker behaves like an expected utility agent, okay? Then what I will try to do along the talk is to connect this expected utility core, this expected utility part to the decision maker's preferences, okay? I will try to justify each ranking according to this expected utility core, okay? So, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sorry, just clarification on yeah. this. You said, give me any preference. Do you any mean any rational or kind of 
Any preference means uh, basically any preference that satisfies the following tenets. Complete and transitive, monotone, which is, uh, I think, an appealing property. Uh, continuous, for technical reasons that I mentioned briefly also yesterday. And uh, basically that's it. Okay, so it, in a sense it is give me any preference, okay? I understand that I put some restrictions, but there are restrictions that are very common in the literature, okay? But I will make precise all these points as I proceed through my tutorial. The only thing that I want you to take from that uh, slide is that give me any binary relation, any preference modeling a decision maker. Even though it is not expected utility, I can extract the part which is expected utility. And then what I'll try to do, I'll try to connect that part to, I will try to say how that part influences, quote unquote, the entire binary relation, okay? So even non-expected utility preferences have an expected utility core. Okay, and this expected utility core allows me to better understand the overall binary relation, the entire preferences. Okay, this is the message of that slide. So, when I said I will move in the first bullet point, I will consider preferences that exhibit an inclination for edging, I said I will have good reasons for it, okay? And the Ellsberg paradox is a good reason to move away from the expected utility paradigm, okay? So let's go back to the aspect, to the Ellsberger, and probably most of you have seen this example, this thought experiment many times, but let me cut, let me make a long story short. Typically people feel, com feel compelled, they prefer, so it's preferences, a, the bet A1 over A2. What does it mean? One more time, bet A1 pays one euro if the color of the ball drawn is red and zero otherwise. Ball a, bet 2 is symmetric in the sense that it pays you one, but if the color of the ball drawn is blue, okay? Why people typically exhibit the preference, at least a student of mine said, why A1 is preferred to A2? Well, because you know, a1, you know the odds, while A2, you have no idea what are the odds, okay? And uh, in particular, if you are pessimistic, you will think that blue might be very unlikely, because you just know that blue and green, it's two-thirds in terms of likelihood, but you do not know the relative likelihood between blue and green, okay? At the same time, if we look at the other pair, A3 and A4, People exhibit the following preference. Many people exhibit the following preference. They prefer A4 to A3. What is A4? Well, A4 pays you one if the color of the ball drawn is either blue or green, okay? While A3 pays you one if the color of the ball is either red or green. One more time, A4, the odds of receiving one are known, two-thirds. For on the other end, a3, the odds are not clear what are, you know, in order to receive one euro, because you do not know the relative proportion of green over blue. So, as I wrote in this slide, typically people exhibit the preference A1 over A2 and A4 over A3. So, if we normalize in the expected utility model the utility of one to one and of zero to zero, these rankings exhibit the fo delivers yields the following result. A1 preferred to A2 means that the decision maker acts as if the probability of red, he thinks that the probability of red is strictly greater than the probability of black, blue, sorry, blue. Okay, on the other end, A4 strictly preferred to, and here it's a typo, A3, reveals that the decision maker deems blue more likely than red. So we reach a contradiction. This behavior is not compatible with expected utility, okay? So we have to move away from the expected utility paradigm if we deem this pattern of choice reasonable, okay? And from a descriptive point of view, it's rather accurate. From a normative point of view, this behavior is not criticizable exactly if we keep in mind this argument that we do not know the odds. So there are very good reasons and 
Many people thought so to move away from the expected utility paradigm. So in the next three slides, I will discuss three models that are very prominent in the literature. Okay, the first one is actually one of the models which I would say started this literature with the Schmeiler 1989 Shoke expected utility. I will not discuss this latter model, but I will discuss the model of Gilbo and Schmeiler. Okay, so which is contemporary because it came out in 1989. Gilbo and Schmeiler provide an axiomatization according to which the decision maker in ranking acts acts as if, as in the expected utility model, in evaluating a bet, he computes the expected utility. But the difference now is that the decision maker does not have one, he acts as if he does not have just one probability, he has several. Okay, think of the Ellsbergern in a sense. There are several, all the earned compositions are reasonable probability models that can allow you to model that decision problem under uncertainty. Now, if you consider all these probabilities in evaluating a bet, you have several expected utility evaluations. So the way in which you aggregate this expected utility evaluation is according to an, a worst case scenario procedure. That is the minimum, okay? Very good. So, just a technical, yeah. yeah. How, is How is C chosen there? Is it? That's an excellent point. So, uh, C comes from, the, I, I didn't discuss axiom up so far, okay? So, C will come from the preferences. So, it's purely subjective. So, at the same time, in a sense, I can tell you that you caught, if you wish, uh, uh, an issue. Which, which is the following one. If you look at this particular example, even in the axiomatization of Gilboa Schmeider, there is no axiom that tells you that C must respect the probabilistic information embedded into this problem. So C does not need to be, for example, the set of probabilities that give probability one third to red, okay? So C can, is purely subjective, because in fact it comes from the preferences. At the same time, you can divide, you can impose extra structure on your model so that the probabilistic information is embedded into the model. Now Massimo or Pierpaolo, correct me if I'm wrong, but this way, this, how can I say, way of introducing, in embedding probabilistic information into the model, it's a quite recent trend in the literature. Up so far, you know, at the beginning, C was purely subjective. So it didn't have to, to respect the probabilistic information embedded in the problem. Massimo? Nothing. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a very similar question. I mean, so what makes us sure that, that the set C it really does represent the agent's beliefs? Because I mean, yeah. there's a behaviorally equivalent formulation, which would be to take the set, set of beliefs to be much wider than the set C and to regard the agent as, as taking the midpoint. And the midpoint on this, on this wider set would be just the lower bound of this restricted set. So, okay, so let me see. Let me, okay, so let me see if I understand the, the, uh, the, the question correctly. First, uh, let me say this. Suppose you give me two sets up to some technical constraint, meaning that if we focus on closed and convex set, that set is unique. Why this mathematical remark is important to answer your conceptual question? It is important because now if I take two, Gilbo two sets and I claim that they represent the same decision maker, then they gotta be the same set. So it is not possible to find two sets of probabilities that represent the same decision maker using this decision rule. Now, if you come out with some other functional form that involves, uh, which is radically different from that one, then you, will f you would have found another utility function, okay? And maybe the set C is... Uh, can Okay. So think about the easiest example I think to use the expression in think of C as a singleton. If C okay, so but if C is a singleton 
I, 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 I probably am failing to understand the question. If C is a singleton, you are expected utility. So you must violate it. This, you know, well, this model, of course, encompasses expected utility because you can choose a C as a singleton. Now, my, the, my understanding of the question was what if the guy has a set of probabilities and then, uh, do you have in mind, for example, he has a set of probabilities in mind, but then he takes, he has a prior over this set of probabilities and he takes the average. That's what you have. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah, and he has a prior over. Okay, so, yes, so, yes, so, well, I have a que an answer for that. Now I, I'm trying to think one short way, one short but precise way to put it. So, what I have, what I, when I say the relevant probabilities for the decision maker, in a sense, if we keep in mind this example, are the relevant predictives for the decision maker. So, for example, I can, if the guy was expected utility, okay, and he thought, and we had, for example, an IID structure underlying, and he thought that the, prob the uh, reasonable models were IID, and he put the prior over the IIDs, and he obtains a predictive which is just exchangeable. Well, we would feel compelled to declare relevant probabilities the IID, right? And we will, even though we will just see the exchangeable probability explaining his behavior, okay? And then the set C will just be that singleton. So all I'm saying is that, all I think I want to say is that set C of probabilities are the revealed probabilities by the decision maker, the ones that are relevant for the decision maker choice, which it doesn't mean that there is, it's just a matter of interpretation. There is no, it's not written anywhere here that the decision maker believes that the true probability model belongs to this class. Okay, that's maybe a way to answer your question. Pier Paolo, given in light of your remark. Yes. Ah, yes, yes. So this is, uh, okay, so but, yes, so it's, uh, yes, so, so also as I made in my remark, those are the revealed probabilities. There is a way to make even more formal these revealed probabilities uh, kind of argument. And it will come when I will discuss that expected utility core that I was mentioning. So here, Going back to the presentation, C is a closed and convex subset. I mentioned that it's unique once you put this mathematical constraint. I mentioned also why the uniqueness is important. Uh, U is a just a utility function over outcomes. You can show formally that C models ambiguity attitudes and U models attitudes toward risk. Why is that important? Because, well, this is not just a mathematical representation, but it captures the elements involved in this representation, captures features connected to behavior. In particular, model ambiguity attitudes, so attitudes the, toward not knowing the odds, and U attitudes toward risk, okay? Another model which is radically different is uh, the model of uh, Klibanov, Marinacci, and Mukherjee. Okay? It's more in line to w with what you had in mind. And uh, actually, it's a model that I think it's fair to say is becoming more and more, and also at an increasing rate, common in uh, uh, applications. And the reason is because, uh, among other things, it is very uh, it's easy to use. Okay, so this model, the idea, the interpretation behind this model is that, again, the decision maker in evaluating an act F, he does not know what is the probability distribution, okay? What is the pro process that is governing the realization in the underlying state space? So he computes the expected utility of the act, but again, he does not know which probability to consider. So here he's considering all the possible probabilities, okay? Again, in order to aggregate these evaluations, instead of using a worst case scenario procedure approach, he considers a prior mu over delta. Okay, so like a Bayesian guy. The difference with the Bayesian guy is that in averaging these evaluations, a function phi is put in between. 
okay? So mu, as I said, is a set, is a prior over the set of probabilities. Phi is a function from the real line to the real line, and u is a utility index. Now, again, this criterion the object involved in the representation are useful, why? Because they capture different parts of the behavior of the decision maker. In particular, phi captures the ambiguity attitudes, and u captures the risk attitudes. Throughout this talk, I will focus, when I will discuss this model, I will focus to the case when phi is concave. So in particular, and it will become clear as I proceed, when the decision maker is uh, ambiguity averse, it does not like the fact that it does not know the probabilities, or at least he acts as if, okay? He does not like not knowing the probabilities. The probabilities on the underlying state space. <laughs> when it comes to decision theory, I claim I know, I know an epsilon better. An epsilon, eh? Okay. 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 Yeah. True. Okay. So. Okay, so to give you, to, give, to, to be honest, yes. So you caught me in the sense that, okay, in English I do not know how to say uh, in a nice way. You caught me cheating. Okay, this would be the nice way. Meaning that, yes, the, it is not just that you dislike not knowing the probabilities. There is, a, there is something, there is something more, okay? So the, the, the idea that you caught is exactly, I, the, the thing, the fact that, what you're trying to point out, I think, is this, is the uncertainty aversion. Instead of having, say, bets for which you do not know the probability distribution, you tend to prefer bets that have a more stable payoff. Meaning that, for example, you tend to prefer cons ceteris paribus, you tend to prefer acts for which the realization, in terms of probability distribution, does not depend on the probability over the underlying state space. So it's not just a, f a matter of not knowing the probability. There is also the payoffs that are involved. So one last, mod uh, one last model is the one of Maccheroni, Marinacci, and Rustichini. And uh, it's a generalization of the Gilboa and Schmeiler model. What is the idea? Let's try to do again this loose exercise in terms of interpretation. In evaluating a lot, a bet F, the expected utility is computed. But now the expected utility, if you wish, is distorted via this function C. So this function C allows you to allows you to consider certain probabilities more plausible than others. Why more plausible than others? Because since all these evaluations are aggregated via the minimum, the higher is the value attached to a probability P, the less likely that probability P will achieve the minimum. Okay, so for example, I, since C can go from zero to infinity, if C of P is infinity, that probability is completely disregarded by the decision maker, okay? Because it will never enter, it will never play a role in evaluating an act F, okay? One more time, this, this model, this model, it's, um, it is not, this representation is not just a mathematical representation, but allows us to characterize certain parts of the decision maker behavior. In particular, C models ambiguity attitudes and U attitudes toward risk. Particular cases of these models, as I mentioned, are the Gilboa and Schmeider model and the Hansen and Sargent model, where the function C is the relative entropy with respect to a probability of reference Q. So now that I presented these three models, you might ask yourself, what, why is he doing so? In particular, in the first bullet point uh, and goal of this talk, he mentioned that he was going to discuss preferences that exhibit an inclination for diversification, a preference for edging, okay? Well, now finally you get your answer, why? Because all these preferences, even though 
they share a different structure a priori. If you look, for example, at the Maccheroni, at the Klibanov, Marinacci, and Mukherjee model, and the variational preferences model, so the second model and the third one, even though they look radically different from an axiomatic point of view, in terms of the properties they satisfy, they share some relevant features. The most important of those features is the one that I displayed, which is uncertainty aversion. And you, you have heard a bit of it when I was trying to provide my clancy answer to Pierpaolo's point. So finally, what it means to be uncertainty averse? Well, whenever you declare two bets equivalent, if you mix these two bets, if you mix these two acts, the mixture is at least as good as both bets, okay, F and G. So this is the mathematical way in which you might want to model a preference for diversification, okay? And all the models that I discuss share these features, or at least this one is probably the most important features they share. And this is what I mean when in the beginning of my talk, this is what I meant when in the beginning of my talk, I said I was going to talk about, for, about preference for edging or diversification. So the quotes that I put under the, the property, well, they just uh, basically say in, another, in a nicer way what I just tried to describe. Uh, you know, in a nicer way, they try to describe the action that is displayed in the slide. So, Let's keep motivation, and let's jump uh, to, uh, to the next slide. So now you have to bear with me even more, because we are going to discuss two slides of mathematical preliminaries. First of all, I need to discuss uh, what is the generalized Ascom and Aumann framework. This is the mathematical setting where we model the problem of choice under uncertainty. So we've seen already a bit of it when I was discussing the Ellsberg paradox. There is S, the set of states of the world, okay? And S is a non-empty set. Sigma is a sigma algebra of subsets of S. So elements of sigma are interpreted as events. X is a convex set, and X models outcomes. Okay? Particularly in the original Ascom and Aumann settings, those outcomes are probability distribution themselves. For the sake of this talk, I know that you, Massimo, will not like this, but think of X as the real line. Okay? It's a convex set. Now, Delta is the set of all probabilities. What do I mean with that? I mean positive, finitely additive set functions, okay, that are normalized at the set S, P of S equal to one. Again, for simplicity, you can also think of S being finite. From a mathematical point of view, makes things easier. From a conceptual point of view, nothing is lost. Now, what is an act? An act is a function that, to each state of the world, I associates an outcome, okay? It's required to be sigma measurable, and it takes finitely many values. I will denote with calligraphic f the collection of all acts, to which also informally I referred to as bets during my talk. Squiggle, well, squiggle is a binary relation of f, and is the way in which we model the decision maker's preferences. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. No, no, please. Yeah. But you have a sigma. It's, it's not an issue. Finitely additive, yes. Yes, but is, you can have finitely additive yeah. me measures on a sigma. I, I put sigma algebra because I didn't want to bother, you know, typically the exercise is done when sigma is an algebra, but I didn't want also to mention, okay, because people are more. Can it be a Boolean? It's, it's, an, it's an algebra of events. Okay. So, I mean, so okay. If you're taking you don't need to be If you... One second. So, uh, since... It's... What I, what I mean... What I mean is, is this. Are set functions that go from sigma to zero, one, okay? They are positive, and they are normalized at S, and they are finitely additive. They belong to this set, which is the norm dual 
of the simple measurable. So I am, you can consider these objects even when sigma is an algebra. I, I, just, I, just, I just put sigma and sigma algebra for, well, for two reasons. One, the most important one is because some people are more used to hear sigma algebra rather than algebra. I, wouldn't, I, I didn't think that probably here would have been the other way around. So, okay. Um, let me move to the second slide. I will not discuss the last bullet point of that slide. Uh, the, la the second and last slide of mathematical preliminaries, uh, I will have to discuss a class of, a, an important class of functions, which is called calligraphic G. I will not mention R Cartesian delta, just calligraphic G. What do you have to do to belong to calligraphic G? First thing, you must be a function that goes from the Cartesian product of the real line with the simplex to the extended real line. And then you must satisfy four properties. The first property says that you are lower semi-continuous and quasi-convex in both arguments. The second property says that you must be weakly increasing in the first argument. The third property is a property of normalization, as simple as that. Whenever I take minimum with respect to the second component, I get T, okay? The fourth property is a property of continuity. So I will ask you to trust me, meaning that it is not a wild and crazy notion, it is not a wild notion of continuity. If you really want to see it, I have an hidden slide for it, but I will not dwell into this if you don't mind, okay? Very good. And uh, an object that will play a role is the essential domain of G restricted to delta. This is a subset of the simplex, and what do you have to, be, to do to belong to this subset? Well, you have to be such that there exists a T in the real line such that G T of P is strictly smaller than infinity, okay? This set is better understood in terms of its complement. When do you, where, where do you not belong to dominium delta G? You don't belong to dominium delta G when G T of P is equal to plus infinity for each T in the real line, okay? And it's literally the effective domain of G restricted to delta. Very good. Example, consider a very natural object in function analysis, a function that goes from the simplex to the positive extended real line, which is convex and lower semi-continuous. Assume it is normalized in this easy way, okay? The minimum is attained uh, at zero. Now construct this additive function, gt of p equal t plus cp, okay? Now this function g belongs to the class calligraphic G, okay? And more importantly, the effective domain of G restricted to delta is exactly the effective domain of the function C. So the effective domain you are used to see in convex analysis. Very good, these objects will enter in the picture very soon. So, when I discuss, as soon as I was done in discussing these three decision criteria, the Gilboin Schmilder one, the, Marina, the Kliban of Marinacci Mukherjee, and the Maccheroni Marinacci and Rustichini criterion, I said, look, even though they might look very different, they have a common, they share a common structure, okay? In, they share, they satisfy certain and important properties. What are these properties that in decision theory we call actions? Well, those are exactly the actions. Those and other two that I will mention in a second are exactly the properties I was referring to. First of all, a binary relation is called an uncertainty averse preference binary relation if and only if it satisfies six actions. First action. Weak order. The preference is, the binary relation is non-trivial, complete, and the pre-order. Meaning that it's non-trivial, it's not, everything is not indifferent to everything else. It is complete, you can also, you can always say that F is weakly better than G, or G is weakly better than F, and it is transitive, okay? Second property, monotonicity. Consider two acts, 
f and assume that the first act pays a better consequence than g in each state of the world. Then f must be declared better than g. Okay? Third property is uncertainty aversion, convexity. Here it's term. Four property, well, four property is just saying that the preference, if you wish, respects the convex structure whenever you look at outcomes, okay? Is the axiom of independence restricted to constant acts, restricted to the outcomes? I said in the slide particularly that uncertainty averse preferences satisfy six axioms, but here you just see four. The other two are in the other slides, well, for reason, for space reason, but also because they are just technical properties. So I will just breeze through them. Continuity is a technical assumption, so there is not much to be said here, other than the fact that is the weaker or one of the weakest form of continuity possible in this setting. And unboundedness is a technical assumption we can dispense with, but uh, here it's considered for in order to make the presentation easier, okay? It's just saying that there are arbitrarily good outcomes and arbitrarily bad outcomes. Yes. So, uh, can you say that, uh, so the monotonicity criteria will... Yes. Yeah. No. Uh, to, in order to give a quick example is Finkelboa Schmilder over the simplex. Okay. If you want, on the other end, if you, it depends which form of strict you want. If you, if you, ah, always strict in each state of the world. Okay. So uh, the counterexample. Okay. Uh, it is. Um, uh, we, in, for this particular class of preferences, okay, so the variational preferences will satisfy this assumption, okay, the, they will have this form of strict monotonicity. Uncertainty averse preferences will not have, will, might not satisfy this form of strict monotonicity because they might have, outside of the certainty line, thick indifference curves, okay? So that's, uh, the, you, you must make, you must, you know, you, have, you must trust me, but uh, this is the short answer. We discussed at the beginning the expected utility model. So, what are the actions that characterize the expected utility model? Well, we order, we already seen it, what it is. Monotonicity, we just discussed it. Independence now is required across acts, okay. And continuity, we discuss it. It's the same form of continuity. What do I mean with that? We, what are the actions that characterize the expected utility model? If a binary relation satisfies these four assumptions, then this binary relation is represented by a utility function of this form. Okay? This is what I mean when I say the four actions I just discussed characterize the expected utility model. What is the probability? Well, the probability is subjective, so it's revealed by the behavior of the decision maker, by the binary relation, but you can represent the binary relation with the expected utility function. But the goal of this talk was to discuss uncertainty averse preferences, that is, preferences that exhibit an inclination for edging, a preference for diversification. So, This is the representation result for uncertainty averse preferences. I will discuss it formally, then I will start to argue that this is not just a metaphysical mathematical representation, but it can tell us something about the models I discussed at the beginning. Okay? To start, this is the common mathematical structure, for example, behind the variational preferences model and the Klibanov, Marinacci, and Mukherjee model, which was a, a Bayesian model in spirit. So let me discuss this representation result first mathematically, and then I'll start to argue that this 
representation captures different features of the decision maker behavior. Okay? So, this theorem is a classic theorem, not in terms of context, but at least, let's hope in the future, but at least in terms of struct formal structure, meaning that it is axiom if and only if utility representation, okay? CMMM 11 means that it's a joint work with uh, Massimo Marinacci, uh, Fabio Maccheroni, and Luigi Montrucchio, and see, I, it's me, okay? So axiom if and only if representation. So a binary relation is an uncertainty averse preference if and only if we could say there exists a non to an affine utility index over outcomes and a function g that belongs to the class calligraphic g such that the decision maker in evaluating an act, he consider the expected utility of the act. But again, he does not know what is the true probability distribution. So he has a family of expected utility evaluations. The function g allows him to distort these expected utility evaluations for each probability p. Remember that g is increasing in the first component. So the expected utility evaluation for p, when you distort it with the function g, is a monotonic distortion. So it does not revert the expected utility ordering. This family of distorted expected utility evaluations is aggregated one more time using a worst case scenario procedure. So let's do one step back. Look at the variational model. Here the function g is additive. Okay. When you move away from the variational model and you just consider the uncertainty averse action, basically, you lose the additivity, but you do not lose the underlying structure, if you wish. Meaning that you have, again, you compute the expected utility of an act, you do it for all the probabilities, and the probabilities, uh, these expected utility evaluations are distorted using the function g. Now, the fact that you have several evaluations forces you, I mean, you need to aggregate them to get a, a numerical evaluation. And this is done according to the minimum, okay? So, these results basically tells you that each uncertainty averse preference is characterized by a pair of objects, and if you wish, a decision rule. The pair of objects is the utility index over outcomes, the second object is the function g, okay? And the decision rule is this minimum, okay? Yeah. There exists an onto and a fine u. So it means that u, u is, a f is onto. Well, x, remember, it's a convex set, and I said that for this presentation, to keep, it, to keep in mind, it's a real line. But it's a convex set, okay? So that's, uh, and automatically, since it's a convex set and we have the unboundedness assumption, it for you have it that it's infinite, okay? Yeah. Very good point. Why? Because why very good point? Because again, I said an uncertainty averse preference is characterized by two objects, by a pair. I will now argue that you. Is an, is, a, is an index of risk aversion, and G is an index of ambiguity aversion. So since I will argue that these two objects capture part of the decision maker behavior, I better make sure that these objects are unique. Why? Because otherwise it would be odd. I will have a decision maker that might be characterized by two different ambiguity attitudes indexes. So which one should I use when I do comparative statics? That's why unique, uniqueness is important. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that's, you remember yesterday and I we had the talk and I said that at a certain point during the talk I will Exact, precisely refer to you. The second part of the talk will be exactly to, rest, to say, look, you see delta there, but in reality you can restrict 
that minimum to a smaller set. And that smaller set will be the probabilities revealed by the decision maker, and this will come uh, in hopefully a few minutes, okay? But it's a good point, also this one, because it will be part of me convincing you that G captures the ambiguity attitudes of the decision maker, okay? So, but first thing first, if I want to claim that G is an index of ambiguity aversion, I need to make sure that it's unique. And long story short, there it's written that you, the utility index is cardinally unique, like a von Neumann Morgenstern utility function, and then once you fix U, then G is unique, okay? So this is the result uh, you were looking for, okay? First, uh, fix how you measure temperature, quote unquote, Fahrenheit or Celsius. Once you fix that, then G is unique, okay? This is, um, in a nutshell, what this result is saying. This other formula tells you as two meanings, uh, as two messages in it. The first one is that, look, G is not a, an object that is coming from the sky. You can compute it. And the second uh, message that we cannot discuss is that you can retrieve it from behavioral data. So again, as Massimo would like to say, it's not a metaphysical object, okay? So, Finally, the, the part of propaganda is over because these results make formal my claim that the, in, the function G captures the ambiguity attitudes of the decision maker. In order to do so, I need a definition of comparative ambiguity attitudes. So I will rely on the one provided by Girardato and Marinacci 2002. This notion of ambiguity attitudes, what is it saying? Look, give me two binary relations, squiggle one and squiggle two, for a problem of choice under uncertainty. I will declare squiggle one more uncertainty averse, more ambiguity averse than squiggle two. Decision maker one is more ambiguity averse than decision maker two. If and only if, whenever I see one being bold enough to choose an uncertain prospect over a certain one, then two exhibit the same preference, okay? For example, I am very ambiguity averse. So if you observe me taking a bet over a constant, over a sure outcome, then you must be sure that if you are less ambiguity averse than me, then you will deem the bet better than the sure outcome, okay? In fact, I always bet when I'm sure to win. So that's what it means to be less ambiguity averse than me. What is this proposition saying? Give me two guys that, are, that satisfy the six actions we've seen at the beginning, okay? They have a representation, a la CMMM11, okay? Two indexes, U1, G1, U2, G2. One for decision maker one, one for decision maker two. Then the following facts are equivalent. One is more uncertainty averse than two. The utility of their outcomes of one, of one is equivalent, is equal basically to the one of two, and the ambiguity index of one is smaller pointwise than the one of two. In other words, the size, five minutes, the size of G determines the ambiguity aversion of the decision maker. One more time, one is more ambiguity averse than two if and only if G1 is smaller or equal than G2, okay? Given that the utilities are the same, but notice that they are cardinally equivalent, so literally Celsius and Fahrenheit. Once you renormalize, then, and this renormalization, it's, it's literally from an economic point of view, costless, irrelevant, it's even better. So now, we finish the first bullet point of goal of this talk, discussing preferences with an inclination for edging. Then I said, then I will argue that we can characterize the, part, the preferences where edging has no bite, okay? This is how we do it. I will say that F is unambiguously preferred to G if and only if, no matter how I edge F with the third act H, the mixture involving F dominates the mixture involving G, okay? If I, have, if I edge G with the same act and the same mix H with, and the same mixing weight alpha, F is preferred to G. Notice that this unambiguously prefer is derived from the original binary relation, okay? It's a derived object, okay? 
So here, I'm exactly mathematically doing what I promise. I'm telling you when edging has no byte. In fact, no matter how I edge F with the third act H, the mixture with F is preferred to the mixture with H. And I will denote it by F squiggle star G. Okay? This uh, notion was first introduced by Ghirarnato Maccheroni and Marinacci in 2004. Finally, the part of the talk, and then I'll conclude uh, to, that I was promising. I'm claiming that this is third bullet point of the introductory slide. I'm claiming that this is the part where the decision maker is expected utility, okay? The first point of this theorem is saying, look, F squiggle star G, so if F is unambiguously preferred to G, then F is preferred to G. So squiggle star is really capturing rankings that are, that are coming from the decision maker preferences. Second part, you don't need to read it. Here is just saying, look, squiggle star satisfies all the assumption of expected utility with the exception of completeness. Okay? Third part, you don't need to read it again, is saying, look, this is not just a part of the decision maker where the, de of the decision maker preferences where he acts, where he is expected utility, it is the part. It is the largest subrelation of squiggle where the decision maker satisfies the expected utility assumption. Fourth point is just mathematically saying that squiggle star is expected utility. But notice that here you have a set of probabilities. It's a unanimity representation. Okay? And finally, the answer to your point, C star is the effective domain of G. C star, so the set of probabilities characterizing squiggle star is the effective domain of G, meaning that you can restrict the minimum exactly to that set C star, which is the set of revealed probabilities by the decision maker. In fact, consistency check, what is C star for a Gilboish milder decision maker? Exactly the set C of probabilities you see from the representation, okay? So I conclude. W with this talk, the take home, tell me, Pier Paolo. This one, this one, this one, bene. So. <laughs> this one. Uh, in America, they say I plead to the fifth. Uh, so, <laughs> so, no, so uh, without joking. Basically, it, it, it is rather, it's complicated to express. But basically, those are all the priors that have as a predictive P, and this is a statistical distance function. Okay, I put it for completeness, so I was right because you had the question, but I, I didn't want to go into details because it's not immediate. It's gamma p, it's easy to explain actually. But the, the entire explanation is the one that uh, I was, uh, and C star, since you ask, is the close convex hull of the support of the prior, okay? So, I must admit that I was not in my best shape this morning. So, with this slide I'll try to give my best. This is the take home message, okay? So w all, the only thing I wanted to convey today was the following. For a problem of choice under uncertainty, we can always identify a part of the decision maker preferences where the decision maker is expected utility, okay? Now, this part where the decision maker is, is expected utility and edging has no bite is the largest part that is consistent with the expected utility axiom with one exception, the completeness part, okay? So now we can see, this was the squiggle star binary relation. We can reinterpret the binary relation squiggle as being a completion of squiggle star. So in particular, violation of independence might come, can be reinterpreted through this completion procedure lens, okay? Now, where edging comes into play? Well, edging comes into play because corresponds to a caution completion rule. 
you aggregate this expected utility evaluation using a minimum, okay? And that's where convexity re-enters in the picture. So all I wanted to say today is to, well, discuss this representation for uncertainty averse preferences that encompasses virtually, I don't know, 80, 90% of the models out there, and to reinterpret this decision rule through this completion procedural lens. Basta. Thanks very much, Simone. That doesn't work. Any questions? Maybe, if, yeah, Richard. So it's about the, uh, uh, more, ambiguous, the, the uh, more ambiguous than yeah. relation, but yes. uh, if you could get that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, I think it's, I mean, I think this is clearly necessary for, uh, I mean, this is a necessary condition, but the question is whether this is really sufficient to capture uh, relative ambiguity aversion between two orders. So, I mean, the intuitive thought would be maybe there are cases where two ambiguous acts, on, one is nonetheless sort of dominates in ambiguity than the other, so it, it, we, we want to consider a slightly more general version of this. But maybe these kind of cases uh, drop out of this definition anyway. I'm not, I'm not sure. Let, let, let me see if I, let me try to rephrase your question and Uh, I think that, if I understand correctly, here you would like to change what I would call the benchmark. So you're saying, look, maybe I have a pair of acts where that I can say clearly that F is less ambiguous than G, and so I want to say that one is less ambiguity averse than two, if and only if I observe F choosing the more ambiguous act over the less ambiguous, then two does the same, okay? So it's a matter of benchmark fixing. Can I interpret your question in that way? So as we put it we've got a comparison between, uh, between a risk option and an ambiguous option. Yes. Hey, so uh, you want to enlarge the set, you know, the set of acts that lies on the right. If and only if. In yes. You are more ambiguity. Ah, so but okay. So you would like to have a a, a different uh, notion of ambiguity aversion that encompasses this one. So you, you, so my answer would be in terms of a characterization of this notion, and I think. Uh, that uh, if you want to talk about more ambiguity averse than one, more ambiguity averse than two, in any, in a generic setting, it's the only way to proceed. The characterization is that if you satisfy this, uh, if, if this is the case, then you can show that it is if and only if the certainty equivalent of one is smaller or equal than the certainty equivalent of two. And actually, this is what driving this characterization result, okay? So, first part of my answer, this is a very kosher way of modeling comparative ambiguity attitudes, provided this characterization, for example, that I gave you. At the same time, I told you, look, my answer was, if you want to use a notion of ambiguity attitudes for a generic setting, it seems to me that uh, a comparison of less ambiguity, an act is less ambiguity, ambiguous than another, is really dep depends particularly on, par particularly on the setting at hand. This one, it's clear. It's clear that a constant act is less ambiguous than a potentially variable act, right? So that's why it works in any setting. And since we don't have any extra assumption of the probabilistic structure of uh, S, let's say, it seems to me the, the notion to, uh, to proceed. But I, I can see how in other setting, richer setting, you might have a different notion of ambiguity attitude which encompasses this one, okay? I have the unpleasant task of having to stop the uh, discussion here and, and no, well, yeah, I, I'm sure we could have, you know, kept going on for a long time here and Let's just thank Simone again for his tutorial.